Michael Simon, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege and honour to be asked to say a few words to you tonight. Can I begin by welcoming you all to Bournemouth, the spiritual home of the Conservative Party Conference? <laughs> and more importantly than welcoming you just to Bournemouth, you are very welcome to Bournemouth West. We are dangerously close to the East, uh, as in the 1980s, it is still so here today that the West is the best. It is also a pleasure to be back in this wonderful hotel. The last time I was in this hotel for a function, well, it was still the Marsham Court Hotel. Uh, it was before the last general election and our guest speaker was Anne Widdicombe. And Anne Widdicombe began by saying that she would say a few words about what was going on in contemporary politics and then she would happily take questions on any subject. And she said there had only been one occasion in recent years when she'd been asked a question where she couldn't answer it. And she said it happened at an audience with event in Surrey, where a lady in the front row put her hand up and said, Miss Whittacombe, I have a question. Can you tell us why on earth would anyone have an affair with John Prescott? <laughs> 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 Simon, Simon referred to the extraordinary events following the death of Margaret Thatcher last year and that wonderful occasion that Simon organised uh, near to St Paul's, where the true rank and file of the Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher gathered in memory of her, still inspired by everything she did, and with a resolute determination that at some point we still believe we can reclaim the Conservative Party as a party of principle, of purpose, a party that is determined to serve the country. In the period after Margaret's death, the nation, and particularly a new generation, was treated to the footage of some of her great achievements. People who had not seen, not lived through that period saw for the first time what happens when you take principle and determination and purpose and give it a good sound majority and put it into number 10. And about a week after she died, the party chairman, Grant Shapps, came rushing up to me in the lobby one evening and said, have you seen the polls? I said, I hadn't. He said, we're up 4% since Margaret Thatcher's death. And I said to Grant that evening, I hope you don't think for a second that has anything to do with you or any other member of the cabinet or any other member of the House of Commons. It was actually proof that even in death, Margaret Thatcher had a greater connection to the British people than many politicians alive yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. And I have been reflecting on what her relevance is for the Conservative Party and for politics today. And I think it is actually rather straightforward. In Iowa, some years after she left office, Margaret Thatcher made a speech, and she said in that speech, if you get your judgment of human nature right, your politics and your policies follow on. Margaret Thatcher didn't need focus groups to tell her what she thought. She addressed directly the nation <coughs> as a nation of millions of individual citizens. In one of her favorite verses of poetry, that verse from Roger Kipling, where he wrote, when the whole world is asleep and there seems no hope of waking, suddenly out of some long bad dream that makes them mutter and moan, all men awake to the noise of fetters breaking and everyone smiles at his neighbor and tells him his soul is his own. Margaret Thatcher started with a conviction that we were a nation of individuals and that it was the government's task the government's responsibility to create the conditions in which the God-given talents and abilities of the people could flourish. That if people could see a link between risk and reward, between effort and return, they would take the risk and make the effort. That the state's job was to create that framework of what she called law-governed liberty, freedom under a rule of law. Freedom, how Margaret Thatcher would have approved of a gathering of sound people in the name of freedom at the seaside this weekend. And so much of that we have lost. 
and we need to rediscover. We need to reunite the conservative family, and we need to reunite it under the banners that have served us so well over so many years. And we need to reject that crippling creed of the left that somehow by an individual striving to do better, striving to improve their lot, striving to create wealth to hand on to future generations, that somehow that is selfish and greedy. As Margaret Thatcher said in one of her conference speeches, a man may climb Everest for himself, but at the summit he plants his country's flag. It is through millions of individuals doing their best that the nation as a whole is enriched. And remember, as Mrs. Thatcher always pointed out, Adam Smith spoke not only of the wealth of nations, but the wealth of individuals. The wealth of nations is built on the boundless energies and talents of millions of free people. In just over a year, we will have a general election. And I know there are people in this room who will not be supporting the Conservative Party in that election. That is sad, but to some degree understandable. And I say this, and I say this deliberately, <coughs> rarely having made an uncontroversial statement knowingly. <laughs> I apologize to anyone in this room who has left the Conservative Party, perhaps to join UKIP. I apologize for those in my party who have insulted and denigrated your patriotism. Yeah. We will only win again when we come together yeah. under the values yeah. that have sustained us. Yeah. Yeah. But I contend to you that this next election is probably the most important in a generation. Margaret Thatcher did her last ever constituency speaking event for me in November 2002 at the Botley Grange Hotel in Hedge End when I was revving up, perhaps an unfortunate phrase, revving up to fight Chris Hoon at the following, <laughs> uh, the following general election. I lost out to him by 558 votes, roughly. Uh, clearly, he got round the constituency faster than I did. <laughs> but Mrs. Thatcher was asked at that event by someone, what was your greatest domestic achievement? And she replied in words that may surprise some of you. She said, Tony Blair and New Labour we forced our opponents to change. Yeah. And to a degree that was true. You could vote Labour in 97 and keep the trade union reform, keep the tax reform, keep the nuclear deterrent. I take you back to late September in Brighton, when Ed Miliband, like some sort of decaffeinated John Major, <laughs> stood on the soapbox, <laughs> stood on the soapbox in the town centre of Brighton, and was asked the question, are you going to bring back socialism? And Mr. Miliband replied in the words that should send a chill up the spine of Middle Britain. That is what I am doing, sir. The ideological battle is returning to British politics, whether some in my party like it or not. And it is time for us to rise to that challenge. Do not deride Mr. Miliband when he gives interviews where he says, he wants to govern like Thatcher. That is no joke. He means it. And what he means by it is he wants to run an ideologically driven government where everyone from the top to the bottom knows exactly what his agenda is and how determined he is to achieve it. That next election really, really matters. But I want to end by saying this to you. Firstly, Simon, thank you. Thank you for bringing this conference to this wonderful seaside town. Thank you for bringing this conference into being. Thank you for the opportunity to put freedom again at the heart of the debate on the right of politics. But I want to end, I think rather appropriately, with some words from what was Mrs. Thatcher's last conference speech as Prime Minister, delivered less than half a mile away from where we sit tonight at the Bournemouth International Centre, where she talked about the Labour Party and she talked about her defeat of socialism. Perhaps it was a premature boast because as she often said, 
In politics, there are no final victories. And it is up to each generation anew to make the case for conservatism. But she said on that occasion, it is time for socialism to return forever to its proper place. The reading room of the British Library where Karl Marx founded. Section, history of ideas. Subsection, 19th century. Status, archaic. <laughs> she went on to say, the new world of freedom into which the dazzled socialists have stumbled is not new to us. What to them is uncharted territory is for us familiar and well-loved ground. Britain has returned to those basic truths and principles which made her great. Personal liberty, private property, and the rule of law on which de democratic freedoms everywhere are based. Ours is a creed which travels and endures. Its truths are written in the human heart. It is the faith which once more has given life to Britain and offers hope to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let this conference be the moment where we rededicate ourselves to the task of promoting liberty, law-governed liberty, where we put freedom back at the heart a political debate and let future generations look back and say of us as we can say with pride and gratitude of Margaret Thatcher that in our day we too kept faith with freedom. Yeah.